and it is my pleasure to be here tonight. Tonight I'd like to talk to you about um, my favorite spiritual practice. This is, um, I think, one of the most powerful spiritual practices we have, but I also think it's the most underused, and it's the practice of forgiveness. My own personal work with forgiveness has brought to me four amazing gifts. And so tonight, that's the title of my talk, The Four Gifts of Forgiveness. The practice of forgiveness has been espoused by almost all of the world's great spiritual leaders. In fact, I think it's probably the greatest contribution that the master teacher, Jesus, gave to this world was the practice of forgiveness. In Matthew 18, Jesus is asked, how many times should I forgive? Seven? And his answer is, no, 70 times seven. Or depending on which version you read, 77 times. But either way, it implies that forgiveness is an ongoing process, that it should be done repeatedly and repeatedly without ending. The greatest prayer in our Western culture talks about forgiveness, about the reciprocity of forgiveness, how when we forgive others, then we can be forgiven ourselves. And Jesus' last words, Father, forgive them. The last thing on his mind is forgive them for they know not what they do. Many other great leaders have talked about forgiveness in our world and used it to affect amazing change. But I'd like to tell you a little bit about my process. As I was preparing for this talk, I was reminded of a country music song that I listened to. I grew up listening to old country music. Old country music. But this one wasn't too bad. It was in the 70s, and it's a guy named B.J. Thomas. And he sang this song, Hey, Won't You Play Another Somebody Done Somebody Wrong Song and Make Me Feel at Home While I Miss My Baby. I think every single one of us in our world has a Somebody Done Me Wrong song. Now, it could be a song about a serious matter. It could be a song about how our family and friends have not behaved in the manner that we wanted them to. It could be a song about something as benign as the guy that cut me off in the traffic this morning. And it could be a song about an inability to forgive ourselves. I have a song in my life. It started playing when I was nine years old. From the time I was nine to 12, I was sexually molested by my older brother. And that act in itself shaped my entire life. My primary focus in life became to keep that a secret. And everything that I did from that moment on was directed towards that. First thing I did was I became the consummate perfect child. Perfect in school, perfect at home, never, ever, ever drawing any negative attention to myself. And I became a master at hiding. And I sang that song for over 35 years. When I was introduced to this teaching at the age of 45, I realized that in this practice, in this faith that we have here, there is the ability to change the conditions of my life. And that was something that was totally foreign to me at that time. And so I began taking classes, like we all do. And I began to see things change in my life. And I decided at a certain point that I was ready to let go of my Somebody Done Me Wrong song. One of the most powerful things that really attracted me to religious science was the music. We have got some amazing artists, singers, songwriters in this movement. The first album I ever bought was Karen Drucker's Songs of the Spirit. And on that album is a chant. And the chant is called loving kindness. 
Now, her loving kindness chant is based on a Buddhist meditation technique called a metta meditation. Metta, M E T T A, loosely translated means loving kindness. And it was one of the founding principles of the Buddhist movement. This act of engaging in such an amazing love for ourselves and for others that we transfer it out into the world. So when I entered Prac 1, I decided that it was time to really begin working on getting rid of this song. And so I began to practice the loving-kindness meditation. If you're not familiar with it, it's very simple. It starts with an inward focus, with the self. And the words are simple, may I be filled with loving-kindness, may I be well, may I be peaceful and at ease, and may I be happy. And I began to use this chant daily, many, 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 many times, every day. Anytime I felt any kind of angst, distraught, anger, fear, anything that came up that I didn't want to feel in my life, I began to use to, to recite the chant. The second phase of the loving kindness directs that movement outward. But when I began to do this forgiveness work, I was only concerned about myself. This was all about me. This was about how I wanted to shift. I didn't care about my brother. I didn't care about any other situation I was trying to forgive. This was only about me. I just wanted to feel better. And so to me, it was very selfish. So getting to that second phase of the loving kindness where I could begin to then send out loving kindness into the world or to another person took me a long time to get to it. But eventually I did. After feeling that peace that came over me as I did it my, for myself, I was able to then turn it outward. And the second verse is very much like the first. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be peaceful and at ease. And may you be happy. And as I would sing this, I would visualize my brother. And I would just have his, pa his face in my, in my mind as I would sing this and chant this. And as I said, I practiced this, practiced this meditation over and over and over again for months. And during the course of practitioner training, I came across something else that I found very powerful. We were, had to read a book on death and dying. And so I chose the book, One Year to Leave, Live by Stephen Levine. And in this book, he talks about another Buddhist meditation. It's called the Soft Belly Meditation. And his focus for that meditation is to relieve, relieve grief that we're experiencing. But he has a wonderful twist about grief. It's not just about being sad. Grief for him is anything that hardens us within our own being. Anything that hardens us is grief. And so anger, fear, doubt, the inability to forgive, all of these things are grief. And we hold them in our abdomen. And so the meditation is all about releasing all of that stuff that we have held on for so many years and just letting it float out of us. And so I began working with this meditation in addition to the loving-kindness meditation. So I'm halfway through Prac 2, December 23rd, 2007, and I get a call from my sister-in-law. She's got my brother in the emergency room. He was driving to work that morning, and he had about a five-mile drive, and he wound up about 20 miles south of Las Vegas, out in the middle of the undeveloped desert. He didn't know how he got there and he didn't know where he was. He did have enough about him to call her. And so she took him to the emergency room, and they found a brain tumor. The next day, Christmas Eve, <clears throat> they operated on him and removed as much as they could of a baseball-sized glioblastoma and sewed him up and told us he had a couple of months to live. A week later, he's released from the hospital, sent home to get his affairs in order. But he didn't go home. He was frantic. He was filled with anxiety. He was almost uncontrollable. And he told his wife, I have to see my sister. 
So she drove him over to the house, and my folks were there. And I was out running errands, so I get a call from my mom. You've got to come home. Your brother's here, and he needs to see you now. And so when I got to the house, <clears throat> he was sitting in the chair, and he stood up, and, of course, he had little coordination and balance. And so I ran over to him so he didn't fall down, and he grabbed hold of me, and he just started saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And at that moment, at that moment, I received my first gift of forgiveness. The first gift of forgiveness for me was, for the very first time, I felt compassion to him, for him. For the very first time, I saw him not as a villain, but as a victim. For the very first time in my life, I was able to see something else besides the anger and the grief and the pain that I had. And what a powerful, powerful gift that was. Four months later, on the day before he died, I was at his house, and we were talking about um, the old music that he used to like to listen to and all the albums I would borrow from him. One of them was uh, Jesus Christ Superstar, which I still have that one. And I was looking at him, and I, and I, he was kind of in and out of it. And I, and I looked at him, and I looked him in the eyes, and I said, you know what, I love you. And he looked at me just as clear as can be, and he said, why? And I said, because you're my brother, and you're perfect, and I love you. And I received my second gift of forgiveness, the ability to love again. A couple days later, we were doing his funeral, and I did the eulogy for it and said the final prayer at the graveside and realized at that moment that what I felt inside of myself was the most amazing peace I had ever felt. In the midst of all of that pain and sorrow and grief, I was given the third gift, and that was the gift of peace. When I began the forgiveness work, I, as I said earlier, I, I began it for myself, and I felt like I was only ever doing it for myself, and I felt very selfish about it. And I realized that it was selfish. But I thought it was selfish with a little s, but it wasn't. It was selfish with a capital S. Because nothing we do is done in isolation. Nothing we ever can do is done only to ourselves. If we truly believe that we live in a universe that is total, u totally united, that there is only one mind, one heart, one soul, then how can anything that we do not affect somebody else? I know that this process of forgiveness, starting it with, my, with myself, was... Um, was the way I had to do it. Because it was the only way I could do it unconditionally. Our founder, Ernest Holmes, says that forgiveness is unconditional or it isn't forgiveness at all. Because I had no illusions about changing anybody else, I didn't put any conditions on it. I didn't determine whether anybody else deserved forgiveness I didn't determine whether even I deserved it. I just knew I wanted to change. And because that was my focus, it was totally unconditional. And because it was unconditional, it set me free. But here's the best part. It set my brother free. The fourth gift of, of, of forgiveness is freedom. 
by focusing on that unconditional aspect of it, not putting any judgment on it, not weighing it down in any way. Freedom was the end result. So when I was engaging in this practice, I didn't know exactly how far it would reach. I remember starting practitioner training, telling a friend of mine, you know what, I'm only doing this for myself. I am not going to get involved in a lot of stuff around here. I am not going to be teaching classes or doing sessions, and I am certainly not going to be talking. The power of forgiveness transformed my life. It transformed my brother's life. I know without a shadow of a doubt that he was freed from that burden that he had carried for 54 years and that he was able to step onto the next existence, releasing that and not carrying it with him. I know it freed me to allow me to be up here today. There's not a doubt in my mind that I wouldn't be where I was doing what I'm doing right now if I hadn't gone through that practice. But the thing about it is, I think often people think that um, we forgive, we get over it, we're done. But it's an ongoing process. It is something that has to be done constantly. I've now developed in my life a practice of, just like we, I have a gratitude journal in the evening, I have a forgiveness journal that goes right along with it. You know, Edwin Gaines says, don't go to bed at night having shut anyone out of your heart. And that's what I try to do. Most often it winds up being forgiving myself, but the way that is. It has to be something that we engage in constantly. It's not something we do once and say everything's okay. I've forgiven. It's all good. I was recently teaching a class that I wrote, and um, one of the weeks on it was on the focus of forgiveness. And there was this woman in there. And um, I started talking about the topic of forgiveness. And she raised her hand, and I, and I called her. And she, and she said, well, you know, I just got out of Beyond Limits. And I've worked through all this stuff. So I'm really good. I'll see you next week. And left. <laughs> so, and, I, and I wanted at that point to, you know, to really call her back and, you know, and, and tell her how wrong she was. But I couldn't. So, um, you know, forgiveness is not something that we just do. But unfortunately, I think that's what the mindset is. We say we're sorry, we go on, we're done. It's all good. But it holds in, in, our, in our being something that does not let us experience these amazing four gifts. If we are holding on to any kind of anger, angst, doubt, fear, turmoil about anything that we think someone's done to us, if we're still playing a somebody done me wrong song, then we won't experience those amazing gifts. The gift of peace, the gift of love, the gift of compassion, and most importantly, the gift of freedom. So I hope you find a time in your life to practice forgiveness. Try it on a daily basis. I can guarantee you it'll change your life. Thank you.